if you look at the times around us, and certainly these are challenging, and not only in, in Europe with the Euro debate and, and the budget uh, issues, but also the recent debt ceiling uh, debates in the US. You see rising carbon emissions. Also, in a way, European and certainly member state hesitance to embrace the sustainable development agenda. I think also, as a, as a person from the private business, uh, you see yeah, a lot of political polarization, so that some politicians have seen more concerned, certainly in Holland, with the media instead of doing the right thing here for society and for its citizens. So it's easy to fall back to a doom and gloom scenario and think that we are lost and nobody can do anything about it. But I think if you, if you look at it uh, and we resist uh, looking burning our heads down and actually looking where the black fuels are coming from. If we resist uh, that, uh, then you can also see that there's a lot happening uh, that is good news. So looking a little bit broader at the whole group of eco-innovators, investments in clean energy technologies are at an unprecedented high level. Uh, businesses like, like ours, like Philips, but not, not only us, are putting sustainable development at the core of their business strategies and innovation. It's, it's an innovation agenda. Um, and in addition to some of cities, states and regions, not to forget that, uh, they are acting. So where the first level of government is a bit uh, hesitating, you see the second level of government, if I may call it that, uh, they're acting in faster and faster places. Uh, there are city events practically every day, but also not only events, uh, but also a lot of doing is taking place. <clears throat> If we take the example from Philips and, and certainly the lighting agenda, then in the past three months alone, uh, I don't know if, if you know, but then in the past three months, first in August, we worked together with Latin and Caribbean countries and they embraced the Santo Domingo Declaration in phasing out inefficient lighting in the coming years. Uh, we had a similar meeting uh, in the middle of uh, September, the African Energy Ministers Conference, where I participated, and the whole African continent agreed on a sustainable development uh, commitment and a declaration. So for them it's clear, leapfrogging is their door to the future. Um, also Middle East, a couple of weeks ago, same thing on, on lighting and Asian Pacific countries, that was last Friday. And early this week, China announcing phasing out of Envision lighting. So what I'm just from one sector, I'm giving this example <coughs> that even though it will take some time to have a global treaty, uh, we all hope we'll get it one day, but we don't have to wait for that because there's a lot happening bottom up and underneath. And certainly had the conclusion that we have is that the direction is unstoppable and uh, it's irreversible. So there's a lot of good news had to celebrate. If you, if you, <clears throat> if you then look at one commitment that we made. Huh? So yesterday evening I was in a discussion on, on European progress and the discussion on 20, 30 percent commitments, embracing energy efficiency targets, building renovation commitments, all good for Europe, but difficult had to agree on at the European level. Well, we as Philips, we committed to 50 percent improvement in energy efficiency of the portfolio, the entire portfolio we put in the markets, 2015 compared to 2010. And, it, and we already know we're going to do it. Uh, we will be moving as an industry to 10% of LED sales in 2010 to 75, 80% in 2020. So I'm not saying it's easy. It's a big job for all of us uh, that we face and nothing happens by itself. Uh, but what has been done by mankind uh, can be undone, uh, but then in, in a positive sense. So looking at that, uh, so who thought about this two years ago when COP15 uh, was such a difficult event and also so much criticized by some of the media? So the question is actually, what are we trying to solve? And I think, so we're not trying to solve will we, will we not, but what we're trying to solve is how can we create more momentum? More momentum for sustainable development. And in part, um, I think also when creating that momentum, we need to realize this is not just a quick fix. But in making things right, we really have to redesign a lot of the, yeah, how we act, our, how we steer our behavior, a lot of public processes like public procurement, uh, transform business models, financing and budgeting. Budgeting, we, don't, we only look one year ahead. Uh, not, and in general, we need to take in life cycle impact and life cycle cost. And not just the economics, but also ecological and social cost and value going into the future. So thereby, uh, that making clear uh, that the decisions that we, auto no, not automatically, uh, but more or less easier, take the decisions that are right 
for our economic future and the prosperity of this and next uh, generations. And in fact, uh, just a small reflection on how the process, and I think also at COP17, and uh, moving beyond to Rio is going to change, there are historically four drivers for change. And you could say in the past decade, we focused a lot on two. So the morality of the change, I think there's nobody better than Al Gore who can, who can voice the morality for change, and it's real. I think sometimes you think it's a bit of a soft thing, but imagine huh, when, you, when you almost leave this planet and your children will ask you, why did you do what you do? I think morality is really real. And the second one is the ecological relevance. We all know climate change is real. We need to fix it. It's not just the global living environment, huh, but very much also our own backyard, huh, so quality of life. But then again, if you look at the morality and the ecological drivers, we know that only maybe part of civilization, 10, 20% of what you could call eco-innovators, how many of us, that they will move on those two drivers. So given economic climate, um, we should move towards the, the other two drivers, which are the economics of the switch and also the social quality of life aspects of, of, of the switch. So the people, because those actually have much more uh, touch upon people's hearts and minds, but also are much more tangible. And it's not just uh, Greece's or Italy's budget, but it's also your, your city budget. Uh, it's also your company budget. It's also your family, your household budget. So if you look at it from that perspective, if we make it more tangible, I think certainly we can change. So how do we make this work? Um, so just a few remarks there. So yes, we need the technology. A lot of it is there. It will continue to improve. Yes, we need the policy frameworks also to make sure that we, that we make this happen and we leave behind uh, this, this old world and these old technologies. We need the financing, not because the switch is costly, but because we need to move towards a different way of budgeting. So we're now very much focused quite often on lowest initial cost, and we know uh, that in many of the decision-making processes, the life cycle impact is not taken into account. So we need to fix that, because we know it's economical. Uh, but most of all, uh, we need to communicate. So you could say how one of the ways to go is as eco-innovators had to go head on with the eco-laggards who resist any type of change. But I think it's much more logical to look at the majority in the middle, the 60, 70 percent, you could call them eco-majority of people who are conscious. Even if I look at my family or my neighbors, they're conscious, but they don't know what it means for them and what they need to do. So you could say instead of going head on with eco-laggards, we go through the public. And if we then communicate how much comfortable, how much more comfortable your home will be, or how much more livable your city, or how much more effective the learning environment in a school, for which we have growing uh, evidence uh, in, in ch when changing the lighting, I think those are the things that matter, and will people express will help people express themselves <coughs> in voting and buying behavior. And then, of course, what they vote for is what politicians will do, and what they want to buy is what leading companies will bring to the market. So how does that bring us back to the road to, to Durban? I think there are just a few reflections at COP15, how we all hoped for public leadership. And we can see how that they, they desperately tried. Uh, at COP17, we know how there will not be, probably not be uh, an overall encapsulating treaty. Um, and we have a larger responsibility as business to take. So if you, if you look at it, I think COP17, we shouldn't look at it as a hero or zero event. It's a step, it's one of the steps further towards into the future. And I think one thing, the last, last thing, also, yeah, because we need to, to make up some time, but the last thing is you can compare it with a, with a school. So if, if we ourselves in the past or our children go to school, uh, we all hope that at the end of a six-year term, or two six-year terms, uh, they leave school with a diploma. Uh, but if we only focus on the diploma, it's going to be uh, yeah, not such a motivating experience. There are lots of grades and lots of exams and a lot of themes and topics in between. So I think they're looking at COP17, there are lots of intermediate results and grades that we can, that we can establish, like in Rio, plus 20. And then gradually, I'm certain if we do this, inevitably, uh, this momentum will be stronger and stronger. And one day, uh, we'll all get this diploma. And then also, like I'm telling my children, once you have your diploma, also work is not over. Uh, there's still a whole working life ahead of you. So what I'm trying to say, Ms. Figueres, uh, and uh, we are there with you to drive this process as a company, as Philips, but also as eco-innovators. I think what you have one last word there. Uh, we all want to reach this sustainable future. 
if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So we certainly see a lot of openings for public-private engagement in establishing uh, this pathway uh, towards a more sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you.